by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idol that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge, eating an idol's temple, in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Some of you know that I'm a proud Pennsylvanian. And uh, the founder of that state was a man named William Penn. He was a devout Quaker who lived in the late 1600s and early 1700s. I don't know a whole lot about him, but one of his statements that he made really caught my attention. And his statement was this, right is right even if everyone is against it. Wrong is wrong, even if everyone is for it. Now if that was true in 1700, <coughs> is it not even more true in our society, in our culture? Now, wouldn't it be nice if all of our decisions and choices were between black and white, clearly right and clearly wrong? Whether or not to pray, whether or not to worship, whether to love my family, whether to tell the truth, whether to work hard, whether to witness and serve Christ and His church. Those are absolute rights and absolute wrongs. Unfortunately, there's a wide and slippery area in between that which is obviously right and that which is obviously wrong. Unsettled issues or issues about which scripture is not absolutely clear. Questions of behavior and lifestyle and custom about which we have no clear statement or guideline from Scripture. Now for the Corinthians, it was a question of whether they ate meat that had been offered to idols and if it wasn't used or eaten by the priests, it was then sent to the marketplace and sold so anyone could eat this meat if they purchased it. Now, when you go to Super One or Walmart or Pats tomorrow and look at the meat shelf, hamburger, steaks, chops, you won't have a big question about whether this meat has been offered to idols. I don't think. The only question, the only difficulty you'll have is whether you can afford it. <laughs> um, 
So, but there are some issues not clearly right or wrong that maybe we agonize over. Uh, I, I thought of some. For example, what movies do we watch? What TV programs do we watch? How do we spend our Sundays? How do we dress? What's our hairstyle? What's our style of worship that we prefer? What version of the Bible do we favor? What books do we read? How do we spend our money? Do we go to the casino even to have a fabulous meal? Do we root for a baseball team called the Brewers? <laughs> Do we wear masks or not wear masks? Uh, I recall a few years ago, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite Christian authors, and I'd never seen a picture of him before. But at the first time I saw a picture of C.S. Lewis, there he was, he had the Bible in front of him, and he was smoking a pipe. <laughs> that blew me away. How can this dedicated, powerful Christian smoke a pipe? How can that be? Well, let's go back to the marketplace in Corinth and uh, get at the meat of this matter. Because the principles that Paul recommends for the first century are still very relevant and contemporary to our time. So what are these principles? First, Paul says, we should praise God for knowledge. In verse 1 he says, we all have knowledge. What they had learned from Paul and Peter and Apollos about God's truth and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that was significant knowledge that they had. What was it that they knew? Well, Paul says, in the first place, you know that an <coughs> idol is nothing. Verses 4 and 5. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idol, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. There's nothing divine or sacred about an idol. It's just gold or silver or brass or copper or wood or stone. <coughs> what you see is what you get. Now if we were to go to Psalm 115, which you don't have time to do, but the psalmist says, idols are made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they don't feel. They have feet, but they don't walk. So Paul wanted the Corinthians to be reminded that an idol is really nothing. I was reading a statement by Chip Ingram. He said, it's human nature to worship idols. For centuries, people have been trying desperately to reduce God to manageable terms. We don't build golden calves but we do put hope in our success, our family, our kids, our education, our prosperity, our money, our comfort, our self-fulfillment. All these things we worship instead of God. So let's not think that idol worship is only an ancient issue. It's a very contemporary issue. Secondly, Paul says there is only one God. God the Father, He's the source and sustainer of life, and one Lord, one Jesus Christ through whom we receive salvation. Thirdly, He is saying eating meat that has been offered to idols even 
is amoral. In other words, it's neither right nor wrong. It's neutral. You're not better if you do. You're not worse if you do. You're not better if you don't. You're not worse if you don't. So we're tempted to say, today in 2021, okay, we know those things, so what's the big problem? Of course it's okay to eat meat, to do things that are neutral and not clearly wrong or clearly righteous. Come on, grow up, get a life. Well, that brings us to our second point, and Paul says, you praise God for knowledge, but watch out for knowledge. Be careful for knowledge. And there are four reasons Paul says that we need to watch out for knowledge. <clears throat> Here are the yellow flags, or maybe even the red flags, when it comes to our knowledge. Number one, he says knowledge puffs up. It makes one proud. We get abnormally inflated like a balloon and like cotton candy. More hot air than substance, more fluff than real stuff. It looks impressive. It feels impressive when we have this knowledge. Number two, he says knowledge leads to distortion. In verse 2, it says, The man who thinks he knows something does not know yet, yet know as he ought to know. So knowledge can lead to a distorted view of ourselves, a distorted view of God, a distorted view of others. Knowledge ought to make us humble, but it also tends to make us proud. The truly wise person is the one who knows how little he knows. In fact, the more we know, the more we know how little we know. Third, third reason we should watch out for knowledge is that not everyone knows what we know. In verse 7, he says, but not everyone knows this. Some can't separate the meat from idolatry and every shameful practice that is associated with idolatry. And they're offended by the very thought of buying the meat, much less eating it or seeing someone else eat it. That's why in verse 9 he says, Be careful, take heed, lest your liberty becomes a stumbling block, an offense. The fourth reason we need to look out for knowledge is that your liberty could destroy another. Let me read verses 9 through 12 once again. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Or if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge, eating an idol in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Knowledge gives us liberty which means power and authority to destroy others or to build them up. To sin against a weaker brother and sin against Christ. So our liberty and the cautions that God places on our liberty is very serious business. So praise God for knowledge. Watch out for knowledge. And thirdly, Paul says, love must be the priority. He says, knowledge puffs up, but 
but love builds up. Knowledge leads to an artificial inflation. Love produces a solid, growing, healthy body and relationships. We know from reading the New Testament and particularly Christ's words that the commandments are summed up in one word, love. That is the greatest commandment, to love God and to love others. Now, if you have knowledge tempered by love, you've really got something. If you have only knowledge and no love, you become hard and judgmental and cold and proud. On the other hand, if you have love only, you become wishy-washy, kind of a milk toast person. That's why John says when we looked at Christ, we saw he was full of something. He was full of two things, grace and truth. He was full of knowledge, the truth, but he was also full of love and grace. So, how does this work out in the Christian fellowship? How do we handle this? Well, verse 13 says, Therefore, if my eating meat causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as the world stands. What a powerful statement. If my eating meat scandalizes or causes another one to stumble, then I will give up my meat forever. So love builds up. Secondly, love causes us to give up our rights. Paul will spend, after this chapter, he'll spend chapter 10, 9, and 10 talking about the rights that he has as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he will conclude, I give up all those rights so that I may win some, so that I may attract some to Jesus Christ. In fact, let's read chapter 10, verses 23 through 33, and even into chapter 11, verse 1. He says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. <clears throat> everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of time, <coughs> for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake, the other man's conscience I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And then in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So love builds up. It causes us to give up our rights. <clears throat> and thirdly, kind of in conclusion, don't be neurotic or par paranoid about this. Okay, he says, you go to someone's house and put meat before you, don't ask whether it's been offered to idols or not. It doesn't really matter. But if that person says it's been, then perhaps you should refrain. You are free. It says, do everything to the glory of God. 
consider others. Don't be proud if you are one who has knowledge, and don't judge if you're one with a weak conscience. Build each other up. Give up your rights for the spiritual well-being of others. Your rights are not to be insisted on because of others. So love. When someone walks away from an encounter with us, let them remember our love more than our conviction. As important as convictions are, just as important, or perhaps even more so, is love. How we consider that person. <clears throat> And he says, follow my example as I have followed Christ's example. Well, what is Christ's example? Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Here's Christ's example. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the high place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What kind of a human rights advocate is Jesus? Not much of an advocate for his own rights. That's what Christ gave up. He surrendered his rights in order to save us. And that's why like Paul says, I will do anything. I will give up everything in order to save some, to attract as many as I can to Christ my Lord and my Savior. Follow me as I follow the example of Christ. Do we realize how much Christ loves us, how he emptied himself of all of his rights and all of his privileges? To give us eternal life. How can we resist? How can we ignore that kind of love? If you are a believer, part of the family of God, this text encourages us to love others, to give up our rights and privileges for the sake of another's conscience, for their encouragement, their growth, and their growth their joy as a Christian, those things are more important than our rights. Follow Christ's example. Follow Paul's example as he follows Christ. Let's go again. God, we thank you for the knowledge and the understanding you have given to us through the gospel, through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the liberty we have in Jesus Christ. But Lord, help us not to use that liberty to stomp on other people. Help us to be considerate of other people and their conscience. Thank you for the example of Christ who gave up everything so that we may have salvation and life everlasting. We ask that you would uh, enable us by your spirit to put this into action in our lives from day to day and in our relationships with others. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.